Welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. I'm an Episcopal priest and uh, a man in long-term recovery, celebrated uh, 51 years um, last December. So been at this thing a, a fair amount of time and am interested in, in the spirituality and the history and the psychology that underlies 12-step recovery. Please go to our website. It's called Two-Way Prayer. You'll find a form of prayer and meditation that they did in the early day, the days that kind of got lost and uh, really turned my life around and uh, hope it might be there to do the same for you. So uh, we have started a new series and it is titled Spiritual Evolution. And that is the same title as a book uh, by Dr. George Valiant. And for many years, Valiant uh, was a professor, a researcher, psychiatrist at uh, Harvard University. And he also had the distinction of serving as a non-alcoholic trustee uh, for Alcoholics Anonymous. So he's a scientist who understands the workings of the human brain, but also a man who understands the workings of 12-step recovery, and how the brain is involved in that recovery process. So it's quite a, an offering, I think, that he gives us. Uh, I've put a link to his book in the show notes, and I would encourage you to get a copy. Uh, if you're interested in 12-step spirituality, I think it can really be a helpful um, asset. The book cites a number of scientific studies. Uh, George is an academic, and, and, he, and he knows his stuff. Uh, and while the first few chapters can be difficult, I'd encourage you if you'd stay with it and just kind of kind of grasp from that the broader concepts that he's trying to convey. Um, and uh, then he moves into what for me is, is still more interesting. Huh? His basic premise is that the brain is where spirituality resides. You know, it's not in our liver. Uh, it comes to us through through the brain, and the more understanding we can have of the brain and how it functions, the, the more we're going to understand spirituality and its place in recovery. So let's go ahead and, and uh, dive in. If you remember from uh, the last episode, uh, he, he gave a definition for spirituality that he's going to use uh, in the development of his book. And he says that it is the amalgam, the blending, the collection uh, of positive emotions that bind or connect us to other human beings and that bind us to God as we may understand her or him. I kind of like that, that, that he added the her, eh? because that her pronoun shakes us up a bit. You know, we're, we're kind of used to it, God, him, her, you know, all that stuff. Uh, well, maybe I don't understand God. Maybe, maybe there's something uh, different uh, that, that I've missed along the way. You know, uh, the, 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 the one change I would make to the 12 steps, I know it's always dangerous, but uh, uh, <laughs> the one I, I do, it's God as we don't understand God. You know, made a decision to turn our life and our will over the care of God as we don't understand God. You know? Uh, because none of us do. Anyway, uh, I think I think George understands that. George focuses not so much on even trying to understand God as as what an experience of the divine, what a connection to the sacred does to us, how it comes about and where it happens in the brain. And humans can have an experience of God. A spiritual experience and and it comes through our brains and specifically through the area of our brains that have evolved over time and, and he says they've evolved because of their ability to experience positive emotions uh, and he names those emotions and these are the ones he's going to lay out and study in his book so their faith hope love joy, forgiveness, compassion, awe, and mystical illumination. 
And so over the course of the next several episodes, we're going to dive into each one of these emotions. And my suspicion is, my hope is, it will come away with a very different or at least a, an expanded understanding of the meaning of spirituality. It, it helped me a lot, and, and I hope uh, it'll be of some help to you as well. So the first one uh, that uh, George explores is the positive emotion of faith. And faith is an important component in recovery, uh, but it can also be a hurdle to, to many people coming into the program. I looked up some of the references uh, to the word faith in AA literature, and here are, are just a small sampling from the big book and 12 and 12 references. Uh, they'll sound familiar to you. Arrived at this point, we were squarely confronted with the question of faith. Some of us had already walked far over the bridge of reason toward the desired shore of faith. Imagine life without faith. There are a variety of ways to faith. In this book, you read again and again that faith did for us what we could not do for ourselves. I must quickly assure you that AAs tread innumerable paths in their quest for faith. They have tried the way of faith and the way of no faith. Finally, when all our scorecards read zero and we saw that one more strike would put us out of the game forever, we had to look for our lost faith. There are dozens and dozens of quotations in the big book in the 12 and 12 specifically related to faith. And, and I'll put a link in the show notes to a wonderful resource. If you're not familiar, it's called 164 and more. You just put a word in, into their little website that they've set up and it, it'll instantly bring out all the references in the big book and the 12 and 12 related to that one word. It's a fabulous resource. So thank you guys for, for doing that. So the first thing uh, George does in this chapter is to distinguish faith from belief. And too often, most of us get these words confused. And, and that can cause some real problems. He says this, belief is about religious doctrines and dogmas. You know, I don't have faith because I don't believe this, or I don't believe that. Well, that's not faith, that's belief. And, and things that can and often do lead to fights and arguments come from different belief systems not from faith. Faith is, is, is more common to all of us human beings. And he says, faith is primarily about trust. So it's almost like every time you see the word faith, substitute the word trust. He says that beliefs can be listed, but faith gets experienced. Beliefs are more like a noun. But faith is dynamic, it's active, and it operates more like a verb. Uh, he quotes a nice remark from Gandhi, who once said this to a British friend. Gandhi said to the man, I don't think much of your Christianity, but I like your Christ. <laughs> Gandhi was a Hindu, but he said he never let a day go by without reading from John's gospel. And why was that? Because it's the mystical gospel. It's the gospel that reports less on the, the history of Jesus, uh, but much more on what it feels like to be in relationship with Jesus. And that's what mysticism is, is really all about. Put the doctrines and the dogmas to one side. What's the experience? Can I have a spiritual experience? Bill Wilson said he regretted that he changed that to awakening, you know, in the, in the big books, 12 and 12 and uh, 12 step wanted to change it, change it from awakening to experience. And uh, they wouldn't let him do it. But he said he always missed that word. And, and, and I think he was on to something there. Valiant says, OK, so faith is actually trust. Here's a quote. Basic trust. Trust that the world has meaning and that loving kindness exists. That's his definition for faith. That the world has meaning, and that loving kindness exists. 
When we come into the program, chances are pretty good. That's missing. The meaning has gone out of my life. It's been drained out of me. I'm disconnected from life. I'm disconnected from people. I'm disconnected from myself. Trust. I put my trust in the bottle. I, I put my trust in lies. I put it into drugs or alcohol or food or sex, eh? or even a relationship. And it let me down. You know, I misplaced my faith. And in effect, we tried to make something or someone into some sort of a God, not consciously, but unconsciously. And it probably worked for a while, but in the end, it couldn't sustain itself. And so we lost our faith, lost our connection to the life force. And, and my experience is uh, it's not a, just a one-time deal. There's kind of a, an ebb and a flow to our connection uh, our faith experience, uh, it's either connected or it's not connected. It's, it's strong or it's um, going away. Eh? And he notes that uh, an atheist or an agnostic may actually have faith. So it's not, it's not about beliefs. He says the opposite of faith isn't being an atheist or being an agnostic. He says the opposite of faith is nihilism meaninglessness. Here's his quote. A nihilist loves no one and is loved by no one, doesn't care for truth or appreciate beauty, has lost hope and knows no joy. Worst of all, nihilists find no meaning in life. Somebody once said, you, you can go without water, for X amount of time, you can go without food uh, for X amount of time. But when your life has lost its meaning, uh, your days are numbered. Uh, and there was a psychiatrist, and I hope the next series, we're going to dive into some of his work. His name was Viktor Frankl. Wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, I'll put that in the show notes to it. It really helped me kind of get through my first year of sobriety. Because I was one lost puppy, eh? I'd lost the connection to meaning in my life. I lacked faith. Or better said, I lacked trust. Who was I going to trust? George notes that uh, both in Latin and in Hebrew, faith is a verb. We do faith. We don't have faith as if it could be quantified and measured, eh? Uh, and the same could actually be said of God, that God's more of a verb uh, than a noun. A noun is a thing, something we can analyze, study, put under a microscope. But a verb is action. Wilson, uh, when he was in detox and had his hot flash, his white light, light experience, he didn't see God. He felt, experienced God. He said, here's his, his quote. A wind, not of air, but of spirit, was blowing all around and through me. He sensed a presence. He felt a presence. He sensed meaning and purpose coming into his life. He had what is called, technically, a spiritual experience, a psychic change. That's what's fascinated me for my 51 years in recovery. What the hell is that? How do you have it? And, and then how do you help people find it? So putting on his scientific hat, Valiant says faith can be manifested. It can be made present in three principal ways. And each one of these is loaded, so we'll, we'll go a little slow. He says faith can be expressed through the culturally determined symbols, beliefs, rituals, and common prayers that undergird a special faith, excuse me, a specific faith tradition. Now, the problem for modern people is uh, we've lost our connection to that, by and large. The symbols that were rich and that speak to the unconscious, the beliefs that are shared and not even questioned, eh? the rituals that we perform, 
and 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 that co connects us to the life force. Uh, many of those have have gone away, but you can be raised in faith, and you can participate in it unquestioningly. Um, my wife and I went to India, um, just a quick stopover, and when we landed uh, in Mumbai, they were celebrating Ganesha, the the god who, who's like an like an elephant, and the whole city, millions and millions of people were out in the street participating in the celebration. It, it was like uh, going back centuries, but you could feel it. It was alive. The ceremonies, the rituals, um, and, and those speak to what? And this is Jung coming in. Rituals and ceremonies speak to the unconscious, which is really where faith resides. The beliefs are up in the conscious mind but the faith itself, it's dynamic, it's alive, and it's living at the level of the unconscious. And you could feel it. You know, uh, I, I've done sweat lodges and uh, uh, ceremonies in, in, in different faith traditions. And, and I, I can get caught up in it because my unconscious mind is woo, resonating with it, you know? And you can sit there and analyze it was this, that, you know, the head stuff. And, and you pick it all apart and you lose your connection to it. He says, as such, faith, like language and culture, is one among many. It's not a matter of one is right and one is wrong. But it's that each one, if it has stood the test of time, has the ability to lead us toward a trusting relationship with the world and with the people in it. And these are what Valiant calls our faith traditions. Uh, the big book says, go see where religious people are right. Okay. Uh, it says we'll find that faith is the way of strength and not weakness. Yeah. And it's what Jung was talking about when he sent his patient Roland Hazard. In says, go in search of faith. I tried everything that psychiatry had to offer, and it wasn't enough. You need connection at a very, very deep part of your mind to heal you, all right? And this was his last hope for recovery, and that's what started us on our way to AA. Uh, and he said he was most likely to find it through his own faith tradition, you know? not necessarily by going to church or by joining a church, but by experiencing what the mystics and the saints of all of the different faith traditions had experienced, connection, joining, linked to the sacred. And one thing that really helped change my faith was when I got interested in AA history. And this was about 20 years sober, hey? Uh, and I learned then about the Oxford group. And what, what intrigued me was that the, the original name for the Oxford group was a first century Christian fellowship. And for some reason, maybe at the unconscious level, a light went on inside of me. And I went back and I started studying all I could about the Oxford group. And I started studying all I could about first century Christianity. Because I, I, I was trying to believe stuff and I was having a hard time, okay? So I went back and I started studying scholars, scholars who focused on what original Christianity, what Christians, maybe even better, what they were like before a set of required beliefs kind of set in. And their faith was based much more on a shared experience. Uh, I put a link in the, uh, in the show notes uh, to a little five minute video. I encourage you to go uh, watch it if you get a chance. It's, it's by one of those scholars who really helped me. His name was Marcus Borg. And he learned, he helped me learn the, the different meaning of faith. And I was stuck in, uh, in, in, in the head and uh, belief systems. This is not about that at all. It's about living it. It's about the way, as he calls it. And, and that was actually the first name for Christianity. It wasn't called Christianity but they were followers of the way. 
It was a path. Um, it was a way to practice life, not a set of religious beliefs. And I think that's what 12-step is as well. It's a path. Follow this path. Don't analyze it to death. Do it. Live it. Try it. See what happens. You may find faith at the end that you didn't have at the beginning. All right? And that's a positive emotion that I can trust, that the world is safe. There's a line in uh, the book of Job that has always fascinated me. Um, it says, um, though you slay me, though you slay me, yet will I put my trust in you. Talking to God. That's faith. Even though everything's falling apart all around me. And sometimes things do. Don't lose my belief. I don't lose my faith. I don't lose my connection to the sacred. I participate in it. It's the thing that will never let me down, okay? It's kind of another definition of God, the, the thing that will never let me down. Might experience some good stuff, might experience some negative stuff. I don't think, you know, connecting to God guarantees me a life of uh, roses ahead. Maybe a lot of pain and suffering, but there will be meaning and there will be purpose. That's the thing. That, that, that the sacred is able to give to us. That's faith. So that, that was the cultural approach. Eh? Number two, faith can be expressed through a trusting commitment to compassionate behavior and community building. Do that one again. Faith can be expressed through a trusting commitment to compassionate behavior and building community. So it doesn't even have to, the sacred uh, gets, gets, comes alive in people, all right? Not just in the beyond, but in the here and now. He says, this is the context within which passionate missionaries, Christ and the Buddha, did faith. Notice that, how they did faith. They lived it. They gave it away. It passed through them out onto other people. You could sense it in them. And, and when you get close to them, you get caught up in it. All right? So go build up a community. Go carry the message. That's, step, that's the 12th step, isn't it? Part of it. Part of it is having had this spiritual experience, having, having come into contact with, with the divine, uh, with faith. I have to carry it out. It's the natural expression of it. But it works the other way around too. By carrying it out, I can gain access to it. Goes either way. A trusting commitment to compassionate behavior and community building. Make that your path. Make that your way of life and watch what happens, you're going to wind up with faith. May not be the faith you had in the beginning, probably won't be, but it'll be a faith that works under all conditions. So huge part of step 12, be a sponsor. And, all, and remember that, uh, you know, I was a counselor for many years, and, and I, I really got this. I was a teacher of what? Of what I wanted to learn. Go teach what you want to learn. And, and then that teaching gives you an opportunity to grow in your own faith. And that's exactly what happened to me. My patients helped me more than I helped them probably. You know, why? Because I got to watch me coming in front of me every day of the week. And look how this guy denies. And look how that guy evades. That stuff is in me too. And you can see it in people. And, and, and seeing it in them helps you to see it, that it also exists in you. The big book has um, a title, of a chapter, what is it? Into Action. Into Action. You might even relabel that thing into faith. You know, moving into faith. Dr. Bob's wife was fond of uh, a line from the book of James. Uh, faith without works is dead. 
You know, faith without works is dead. And so you can see dead AA meetings and dead churches and uh, dead seminaries and, and dead everything, see? Because there's no work involved in it. But, but if, you, if, if, if faith is there and it's being transmitted, it's alive. Third way that faith can be experienced, Valiant says, is through positive emotion, through a personal sense of inner illumination, going inside, prayer, meditation, practice, white light experiences too. This is what St. Paul experienced on the road to Damascus. This is what Bill Wilson experienced when he was in his detox room. God, if there is a God, help me. Boom, lights went on. Eh? These things are quick, dramatic, not knock you off your feet kind of experiences. I'll never forget, I had a patient in treatment who um, was not doing real well, a young guy. He was mouthing it, but not connected. And uh, he left treatment, went AWOL, and uh, got drunk, of course. Wound up in a hotel somewhere in town. This was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana back in the day, winds up, he gets kicked out of the hotel, winds up uh, drunk, doing drugs, and, and he's in an Exxon bathroom. And, and he, he kind of comes to there, and he looks in the mirror, and he had a spiritual experience, because he didn't know who the hell was looking back at him. It knocked him to his core. He changed. And he, he came back and he begged us to take him back into treatment. And we were pretty hard-nosed back in those days. Probably wasn't a good thing. Uh, well, it wasn't a good thing. Uh, we took him back. And he was a changed man. He had an inner illumination. And, and, and bottom has a way of opening us up to the light that's in us but can't be seen, and suddenly it breaks through. Leonard Cohen has a, has a great, you know, there's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. That's how the light gets in. You got to crack up in order for the light to get in. I guess it doesn't have to be that way, but uh, sure as hell is the way most of us get here. <laughs> We're cracking up. I used to tell my sponsor that. He said, well, that's a good thing. <laughs> Keep cracking up. It's, it's all right. It's all right. So that those are those the quickie kinds. I kind of had that. I fell apart. Uh, I didn't, uh, I was in Cleveland, Ohio. Great place to hit a bottom. You know, this back in 72, the rivers were on fire. It was just hell on earth. And uh, <laughs> man, all of the ego stuff that I had put together and said, this is me. It was gone. It was just gone. And, and I heard a voice inside of me that uh, I was going to run to India, <laughs> get holy, or I was going to run to Australia and get drunk. And Bill, the voice said, Bill, you're 27. If those are your choices, there's something wrong with you. And, and that voice, it wasn't my voice. It, it was so much deeper a part of me if it was a part of me. And I think it was a part of me. Uh, but it knew, it intuitively knew what I needed to do, how I needed to change, and it was going to guide me. First time I heard the voice. Didn't hear it again for 20 years till I started doing two-way prayer. That that voice can be accessed. That that voice is really kind of coming from our unconscious. And it wants to lead, it wants to guide. That's the, the great source of faith, you know? Jung was once asked, do you believe in God, Dr. Jung? And his response was, believe? believe? No, I don't believe. I know. I know. How did he know to experience? He knew what it was like to be in relation 
his ego to be in relation with that which is greater than us. Call it God, call it whatever you like, you know? Uh, call it the self. He wound up calling it the self with a capital S. He says, that's who I really am. You know, we have that spark of the divine in us. And that spark is, is what connects us to life. Big Book calls it what? The great reality. Where is it? Out there? Hell no. Within. So you got to go within. You got to go within. And if you go within, the, the, these spiritual experiences, awakenings are going are gonna to happen, sometimes fast, sometimes slow. Doesn't matter, but it's that faith, that trust in life, in my life, that's starting to come alive again. And, and, and that's what <laughs> religions are all about, you know, that which was dead has come back to life. You know, seeing it every day in 12-step recovery. George gives a, a case study. Psychiatrists are really big on case studies. And if you remember from the first couple of episodes, Valiant was in charge of a, a magnificent study at uh, Harvard that studied people over the course of their lifetimes. You know, from 20 years old to 70, 80 years old, you know, one, one was a, a group of men, and the other was a group of uh, teenagers, uh, street kids in Boston. Studied them also. Now, what was going on with these people over the course of their lives? And one guy that they studied, his name was Bill, we'll call him Bill G. And uh, he came from a family that, if you were to believe the scientists, the guys who interviewed him at the different stages of his life, this guy stood no chance of ever making it in the world. Uh, he had been given up for uh, foster care by his mother. He was abandoned by his father. He was beaten repeatedly in many of the foster care situations. He said if he, if he was dressed nicely and given some good meals, he just knew somebody was coming from the agency uh, to investigate and see how he was doing. It. But something happened to him. I don't want you codependents going crazy on this, but uh, Bill met a woman, <laughs> in it always the way, uh, who changed him. But she loved him. That was the important. She loved him. She thought the world of him. And over time, slowly but surely, he changed. See, one of, one of uh, Valiant's points is that we can evolve. Yeah, there's, there's brain stuff evolving in us as a species. That goes on. But individuals never take away from us the ability to change, to transform. Don't give up on people. The guy changed. And he, he attained what, what the scientists call emotional safety. Is the world safe? Is it safe for me to be here? Maybe it is. You know, through, through this woman's love. Maybe I can trust. And after 33 years of marriage, Bill's wife dies of cancer. Everything he had trusted in went away. That's why you need to be very careful where you put your trust. I don't, I don't know that we can always choose. Sometimes it just happens to us. But, but. People will leave us. People can let us down. Um, I had a sponsor who, who said, you know, very important. It almost sounded like heresy when I was, you know, first hearing. He said, you know, Bill, if AA went away, I'd still stay sober. Why? Because he had connected to something deeper. He had connected to what AA leads to, what NA leads to, what CA leads to, what OA leads to not dependent on the institution. Put it in the one place where it will never go away. But bills went away. And, and his life went to hell again. Five years later, uh, he's hospitalized for what? Major depression. The report who, who, who went to visit him as part of this longitudinal study he was mentally, physically, and spiritually ill. Valiant said he was consumed 
by negative emotions, anger, fear, despair. And, and he had a tremendous debilitating back pain. He was an invalid. And, and I, I don't know, I mean, physical, uh, does our psychic mind uh, affect our bodies? I really believe it does. Uh, and he found a healer, um, someone who brought him relief, again, an experience of the divine uh, through a healing practice, relieved his pain. But it went deeper than that, I think, you know? Uh, and whoever it was that, that did the healing taught Bill how to heal. And this was important. Eh? When you think about AA, you, you can't help but think that this is exactly what happens to us, you know, because it's the same story. Because soon Bill began what? Healing others. Now the flow was coming through him, it wasn't dependent on another person. He was experiencing the power of the divine coming through him and, and, and going out to others. He reported to the psychologist who was visiting with him, these were the happiest years of my life as he was now able to help other people. How many times have we heard that said uh, by people who got, you know, five, 10, 20, 30, 40 years in, in the program? It just gets better and better. If you're plugged in right, if your faith is growing and deepening, you know, as you become less and God or life or love, call it what you will, becomes more. I love the line from Thomas Burton, asked once if he believed in uh, an afterlife. And he said, well, yes, I do. But you know what? There won't be much of me there. Through his faith, his clinging to himself, his clinging to his ego was gradually, gradually removed. And as it was removed, he was a lover of, of the world, of God, of himself. Bill said, it's important that people know I don't do the healing. I say to them, don't thank me. Go praise God. And Valiant adds this. He said, he could just have accurately said, don't thank me. Go and praise unselfish love. I think I've said this before in, in some of the podcasts that the alcoholism addiction, it's a love disorder. Yeah, it's got brain chemistry stuff and it's got all, all of that stuff going on. That's all true. But at its depth... <laughs> When you get down to the ism, you're talking about cut off from life, cut off from vitality, cut off from God, him or her, or it. Doesn't matter. It's wrong. <laughs> but it's there. But it's there. Eh? And I think that's what happens to us in recovery. So we get loved on. Isn't that what happens to us? We get loved on. People loved me in early AA. They loved me into recovery. They saw in me what I couldn't see in myself. Eh? And you might say we catch faith from other people. Something gets activated deep inside of us. Something that's been inside of us, but it's dormant. We can't see it. We don't believe it's there. They see it. They know it's there. And, and, and they bring it out in us. It's waiting to be awakened. Valiant says faith involves taking in and then giving back as a flow. We breathe in faith, and slowly we're able to breathe out love. There's the verb. Neurologically, he says, faith begins with our trust in the mammalian cry of separation. He goes on, I have faith that if I fall and cry out, someone will pick me up. That's the evolutionary thing that's going on, that, that, that scientists have traced in the development of Homo sapiens. 
you know, that that trust, that that long time in childhood, where it is safe for somebody's going to come and somebody's going to take care of me, unlike the 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 buffalo or the cow who's 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 born and ready to go out on the plane, you know, in the field, uh, they hit the ground running, you know, not so human beings. We hit the ground dependent and we are in need of being loved and nurtured. And if that don't happen, there's great damage. And, and let's, let's be <laughs> very frank. Nobody gets loved the way we need to get loved. And every one of us has some damage. You know, you can get too much love. You can get too little love, right? Ain't too many Goldilocks out there who get just the right amount. You know, either one can do too much damage. And, and, and so, so we, we, we need some repair work, you know, and AA 12 step, perfect, perfect place for that to happen and a healthy fellowship perfect place for that to happen prayer and meditation really helpful uh, for that to happen so let me read this one again because i went off on a tangent so neurologically he says faith begins with our trust in the mammalian the cry of the mammal the cry of separation the mother the father the tribe hears that and 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 they come to the aid and, and, and through that, the child learns safety and security and has faith. They're going to be okay. That's faith in action. Valiant talks about faith evolving. It says, during maturation, the growing up time, cognitive religious beliefs tend to evolve over time towards what? Emotional and spiritual trust. We mature in our faith, or at least we should. Immature faith, he says, draws a circle that pencils some people out. Mature faith draws a circle that pencils all people in. It's almost always immature and illusory to maintain it's my way or the highway. Rigid, fundamentalist, belief systems that ain't faith that's death maybe helpful in the beginning richard Rohr says it's a great way to begin it's a god-awful way to end we need to be evolving we need to be changing uh, going back to his studies of the human brain uh, george notes that faith arises from three different sources one is conscious two are unconscious the conscious happens in the neocortical, the front, front lobes, uh, and the two are unconscious that are in the limbic system, the lizard brain, the mammalian brain, that inclu includes different parts uh, of, the, of the brain, but it's kind of stacked on top of one another. So first, we'll, we'll look at the conscious route. Hey? He says, this is rooted in our cognitive need for certainty. The second is rooted in our unconscious social need for community. And the third, uh, also unconscious, is rooted in our emotional need for trust. So looking at the first one, the cognitive, the, our need for certainty. And, and, and he says, ambiguity makes human beings anxious. Certainty calms us. And this is the area where our beliefs develop. If I do this and I do that, things are going to be all right, you know? Uh, but it's very immature, you know? It isn't bad, but it can be dangerous. If it's a healthy belief system that I'm born into and that's nurturing me, hey, uh, then it opens us up and expands in love. But if it's a closed off or a delusional system, you know, uh, then this is what generates religious wars, jihads, uh, political uh, and religious cults of all sorts. And I think we're seeing a lot of those developing right now in the world. Why? Because the faith stuff has gotten weak. It's gotten stuck at the level of um, beliefs rather than transforming love. 
Um, and that's what we've got to get back to. William James says, watch these things over time. Watch for their fruits, and, th and then you will know them. You know, things can start off as a cult, but it, it can grow and change over time. If, if, if it's growing and changing and growing towards love, it's going to stick around. It's got some depth to it. So look at, the, look at the Buddhist tradition, the Hindu tradition, the Christian tradition, Jewish tradition. These things have been around for thousands of years. And, and parts of them, not all of them, I mean, not all the different parts, but the parts that are evolving in, in a helpful, fruitful, loving manner, there's something there, you know? It, and it's, 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 it's at the core of, of what the um, transformational process that, that started the whole thing uh, is all about. It's why the first century Christian stuff was so important. You know, it, it, it wasn't that, oh my God, uh, someone has finally explained the Trinity to me. Isn't that nice? And that's not why it grew. You know, one of the reasons why it grew, because look how they love one another. Look how they love one another. One of the things they stopped doing was, was killing little girls. In the Roman world, they used to, you know, I want boys, uh, the girls are going to put them out in the cold. Christians said, no, we're not going to do that. This is the power of love. It's the power of love to change people. The second um, route to faith, route, route, excuse me, to faith is, is, is less conscious. And this is the loving community. It's our need for loving community. And you look at this through the lens of evolution. George says, love arose in us mammals in part so we would care for our annoying children. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Let's not kill those annoying little brats. So love is evolving inside of me. Compassion is evolving inside of me, all right, uh, as a check against self-interest, you know, selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our problem. Well, it's the root of our species problem, too, you know? How do we become more loving as a species? Because if we don't, we're going to destroy ourselves. So the more loving one is, the less killing is going on, the more kids are surviving, you know? Uh, and our need for loving community, uh, it grew, and we needed to temper our own disruptive, negative emotions, he says. We've all got them. We've all got them. They are a part of us. You know, you can't deny them. But you can't let them run rampant either. Communities of love have the power to evoke in us trust. Is this place safe? Am I really welcomed here? How do you feel when you walk into an AA meeting? Is it cold and sterile? Or are people greeting you? you know? And when they greet you, are they not bringing out from you the love that's been injured? And, and it's like, I'm home. You know? And the same is true when I, when I do prayer and meditation. You know, I've screwed up in the world. And that love that was growing in me didn't do so well today. I need help. I need to reconnect with it. I, I need to fill up with it again. And then carry it back into the world. It makes a little reference here to small groups, small communities. At the Oxford group, and, and, and then, of course, AA grew out of the Oxford group. They, they really started and, and really developed and pioneered uh, the power of small groups to instill faith and trust uh, in people and, and, and to bring out from them the love that is, is, is in them. So, I mean, and everything that's uh, split off from AA, so CA and NA and each one of those, they split off to go find, you know, uh, a loving little community. They all start off small, and that's a good thing. Group size, six, eight, 10, maybe 12 people, tops, tops, tops. When it starts getting bigger than that, it becomes uh, unwieldy. 
uh, I don't feel as safe as, uh, as I can in a small group. Uh, I, I was told kind of, <laughs> I got so, you know, stay out of clubhouses, you know, the dens of iniquity. You go, to, you, go to, you go to meetings in church basements. You find a home group that's small. Find some healthy people uh, who meet weekly, who come together. That's going to grow you. And it's the same people. It's the same people who are watching you, loving on you, and encouraging you, and, uh, and, and bringing out what, what's already in you. See? See how they love one another. I mean, that's that's really goes to the heart. Valiant warns that loving traditions can petrify uh, into religious intolerance. The loving message becomes institutionalized. It gets lost. And then it loses its power to transform. And we lose our faith in it. See? Okay. The third source of faith, he says, comes from uh, what? Inner illumination. And this involves in voluntary emotion, ecstasy, mystical experiences. He goes on, to be useful, inner illuminations can never be all about me. It's not just having, you know, Bill Wilson's white light experience, you know? That could be all about Bill. But that it, it, it evokes empathy linked to others. That's when it becomes valuable. He had two visions in detox. One, one we talk about all the time. The other rarely gets talked about. First was his white light experience. He feels like he's on a mountain. Uh, spirit, not of wind, but a, a spirit is, is, is rolling. He's in God's presence and he feels free. But he has another one a day or so later. And that was a vision of carrying out what he experienced to other people. Because if it could free him, it could free them. And he knew that. He had a vision of that. You know, that was faith. That was faith. Trust. And he trusted. And for six months, he failed. But it didn't diminish his trust. He kept doing it until he found Dr. Bob. A lot, a lot in this uh, chapter uh, on faith that I think will... Uh, open you up to uh, maybe a different and deeper appreciation of of what's going on inside of us. Uh, I, I know it, it did for me. And, and having done two-way prayer for the last 31 years, I, I just couldn't help but, but see uh, through that lens. You know what I mean? That, um, that I, I could look at my life in AA first 20 years, where I had kind of the cognitive, intellectual faith, um, kind of fuzzy. Uh, you know, I, I guess it's working. And I worked it as, as well as most, I, I think. I really did. Uh, but something was missing. And, and where was that something? It was at the unconscious level. Some of it was changing, yes. But when I got to two-way prayer, when I was taught how to, uh, to do what? To close my eyes to connect with a source of love that exists inside of me, that even when I screw up, it never yells at me, that it encourages me uh, to, to get up the next day, to go out and, and to be of service to people uh, who are coming into my life. That's the part of me that uh, got disconnected. And that's the part of me I call faith that uh, is the only thing that's really worth developing. My beliefs in this, that, or the other thing could be wrong, probably are, but this, uh-uh, this is not wrong. This is life. This is what the faith that works, the faith that uh, is, is constantly leading us on and growing us into what? Into who we were always meant to be and kind of missed, missed the boat along the way. Never too late to catch the boat again. Uh, Fairies leave uh, quite often, so uh, jump on. All right, uh, so there's the first, first chapter on, on one, one of these emotions. Uh, hope you got to see it maybe in a little bit of a different light, you know, that, um, that there's hope, <laughs> hope for the hopeless, and, and we're geared for it. Our brains are, uh, are, are, are developed in such a way that, that we have access to it.
and, and then we can pass it on, pass it on uh, that the world is a better place uh, when we leave it. I used to say to people when they came into treatment, you know, this, this, this treatment center, um, it's not going to be the same place now, now that you've come into it. It will either be a better place or it will be a worse place. And that depends totally on you, what you do. Same is true of your, of your life, you know, your family, uh, your community, your country. Uh, it'll, it, it won't be the same place as a result of you. You can impact it. Gandhi impacted it. Martin Luther King impacted it. Jesus impacted it. Moses impacted it. Uh, Muhammad impacted it. St. Francis impacted it. It got a hold of faith. And they lived by it. And it changes the world. Anyway, I think it's going to be a good book. Uh, uh, I'm getting a hell of a lot out of it. Hope you do too. And I hope this was helpful. And if it was, keep coming back. And if it wasn't, come back anyway. Thank you.